Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Um, so today, um, or you know, today and Thursdays, so we're going to be doing our final presentations. And so first up, um, you know, oh, just to just to kind of you know, just to kind of let everyone know, I'm going to be grading this. So I have the rubric kind of right here in front of me on my iPad. So I'm, I'm basically marking on that, you know, as you guys present. And I also have the timer right here too. Okay? So I'll be I'll be responsible for keeping time. Um, and so you know. Every about every five minutes, I'll, I'll type something in the chat just to um, you know just to help you guys with the timekeeping. Okay, uh, and so for this Zoom call, I've enabled screen share, so everyone uh, should be able to share their screen. Um, but you know, obviously, you know, you only need one person to uh, to share um, their screen, um, you know, at any given time. Okay, okay. So our first group that we have up today is uh, um, the Fukushima uh, nuclear uh, nuclear meltdown. Okay. Um, and so, uh, if you, uh, does, is everyone in that group here, um, ready to present? Oh, one of my members, Jonathan, is having trouble logging into the Zoom meeting. Okay. Uh, but Robbie, uh, you have the slides, right? So I, I talked to Justin earlier. So you can, you can go ahead and, uh, and share your screen. Are you there, Rawabi? Okay, great. Okay, um, so you you said you're still waiting. So someone's still uh, um, trying to to log in. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll wait a couple minutes for uh, for them. Um, but I guess in the meantime, are does anyone just have any questions about you know um, how any of this is going to go down for for this week? Okay. All right. So if there's no questions, you know, I, I, I do want to, uh, you know, get rolling a little bit because our time is going to be a little bit tight this week. Uh, and so Fukushima Group, whenever you guys are ready, you guys can go ahead. And then basically as soon as someone starts uh, talking, I'll, I'll start the time. Oh, they, uh, oh, hi. I, I, I was just going to say, if they're not ready, PGE and Wild Parts can go first if we need to. Okay. Uh, are you guys, are you guys okay with, uh, with that, uh, Fukushima group? Yes, because Jonathan said he was resetting his password because okay. he log in. Okay. Thank Wildfire you. groups, why don't you guys go first then? And then we'll, uh, um, you know, we'll come, we'll come back to Fukushima after this. All right. Perfect. Sorry about that. Give me a second. Mm-hmm. Is my group ready? Uh, yeah, I'm ready. I don't know about everyone else. David, Brianna, Ajit, are we good? I'm, I'm good. Okay. So if everyone's here, you just go ahead. And then uh, once you start, start introducing yourself, or I'll, I'll start the timer after you move, move on from the first slide. Okay, sounds good. All right, so this is PGE and Wildfire. This is the Pacific Gas and Electric Company and all the wildfires that they created in um, from 2011 to about 2018 up in Northern California. My name is Blake Fournier. I'm David. I'm Carter. I'm Ajit. I'm Brianna. Perfect. All right, so I'll be doing the introduction right now. So uh, the Pacific Gas and Electric Company, or PG&E, is an American investor-owned utility with uh, publicly traded stock. Um, PG&E provides natural gas and electricity to most of the northern two-thirds of California. Uh, and they also have a market cap of $3.24 billion as of January, 26, or, uh, January 16th, 2019. And uh, PG&E has caused over um, uh, 1,500 wildfires in the past years. I believe it's six years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, 
especially uh, one of them being on November 8th, 2018, which a wildfire tore across a rural section of Northern California. And it was considered to be one of the most deadliest and most destructive fire in California history, um, which it consumed a town, the town of Paradise. The, the name of the town was called Paradise in a matter of hours, forcing its residents to flee in panic. Um, an investigation found out that the Camp Fire, which was the um, name of the fire, it's not Camp Fire, it's Camp Fire was caused by a line owned by Pacific Gas and Electric. And it was, the latest, uh, it, it was the latest in a string of fires that led uh, the state's largest utility company to file for bankruptcy. However, uh, with this bankruptcy, millions of Californians relied on this utility uh, to, for example, you know, keep the lights on and uh, et cetera. And some are questioning whether PG&E can be trusted to do, to do that safely and reliably. Um, this is because um, in our research, according to documents reviewed by um, the Wall Street Journal, the company knew for years its equipment had the potential to start fires, yet repeatedly delayed the necessary upgrades to make uh, some of its lines safer. So that's just a quick introduction of um, pg and &E and the wildfires that they started around. California. Okay, so so just a little uh, historical context on PG and E. Um, it's sort of as an entity, it's more or less been around for almost as long as the. Oh, uh, we seem to. Have... Sorry about that. No worries. Um, historic. Oh, all right, there we are. So historic context, right? Like I was saying, uh, they've been around uh, more or less since almost for as long as the entire state. The uh, two predecessor companies, San Francisco Gas and Electric and the California Gas and Electric Company were both founded in the 1850s and uh, eventually merged in 1905 to become PG&E. Um, and they did that, and so now they're, uh, today they provide uh, electricity and gas to most of the northern two thirds of California. So most of, you know, the large, at least like all the Bay Area, all that, and a lot of the northern parts. Um, and then, so in the 1990s, there was a general push for uh, deregulation and uh, the company since then has been involved in a lot of uh, very high profile scandals. Uh, so it not only have they been, I mean, they've basically since deregulation, just about every four or five years been involved in some really bad scandal involving either a fire they started or a gas pipeline explosion in a city. So uh, they're, you know, since deregulation, they've, they've been a lot involved in a lot of stuff. Um, and this is also this most recent trout is not the first time they've declared bankruptcy. Um, they declared bankruptcy in 2001 during the California energy crisis, which involved Enron. Um, so, you know, they're not dealing with, uh, you know, they have a long and storied history of shysty business. Um, and so, uh, like we were saying, uh, they were found uh, legally responsible for multiple wildfires between 2015 and 2018. Um, which not only led to the bankruptcy, but also uh, the company began uh, as they were like, while they were still working through the bankruptcy proceedings, uh, shutting off power during windy times, which they uh, ostensibly said was for safety, but uh, a lot of people accused them of doing that essentially to play at politics. So uh, next slide. And then the economic uh, context. So uh, pg and &E is one of six investor owned public utility companies in California. Uh, it has been the largest electric utility business in the United States since 1984. Um, they own over $68 billion in power plants, grids, gas pipelines, uh, you know, distribution systems. They own over 100,000 miles of distribution lines within the state. Uh, and they're also the largest private owner of hydroelectric facilities. So dams, lakes, pump storage, all of that in the USA. Um, so following the series of wildfires they were found responsible for between 2015 and in 2018, they were facing $30 billion in liabilities, um, which essentially led them to begin and end the bankruptcy process between January 2019 and June 2020, and they're still litigating because it's just such a disaster. All right, so here's for the personnel context. So the main line that, that was in question throughout all these uh, these fires and everything was the Caribou Palermo. It's the main one that um, that they've seen was <clears throat> was a quarter century past its estimated work life. The company's been around since the 1920s, and they estimated that this its long uh, its life should be about 75 years. And 
ever since 2013, they've been saying that they wanted to replace specific parts on it or even the whole transmission line itself, but that just never, it, they just kept tabling it to the next year up until 2018 when all that stuff happened. And then I go on to say PG&E had multiple years in a row of the replacements of many wires and towers and hardware for, hardware for efficiency. Um, and this is right before the wind started to pick up and those huge fires occurred. Uh, the main issue that PG&E claimed was why nothing got fixed were challenges related to per permitting in a federal forest. Um, there was a lot of a lot of um, brush in that area in the first place, and they didn't want any any um, specific linemen to go up there and risk their lives in order to um, fix the electricity in the first place, knowing that it could cause a specific harm like this. So. This is just a, sh a map to show how much power they were um, distributing throughout California. It's about 760,000 square miles. And a lot of the um, reasons why they never shut off the power in the first place is that they got a lot of complaints by the fellow neighbors. Um, back in the 20s, you know, it was obviously a booming time for in California too. So they didn't ex anticipate the amount of power distribution to go this far and this fast. So to turn off a lot of these, um, these central transmission lines throughout California would have would have brought a lot of people just random blackouts and power outages, which obviously the company didn't want to have. So they were trying their best to do that too, from what I read in articles. Um, 2017 was a, was a big year for PG&E as their CEO, Geisha Williams, resigns, along with half of their executive board. Um, back in, backtracking to 2015, they had regu regulatory papers for the company. They were still um, as as vintage as paper wall maps of, you know, their coverage along with push pins to show where the tr uh, oh, the transmission lines were um, transmitting power to. It wasn't anything modern. It was just literal paper wall maps and push pins <laughs> along with, in, with investors and in trying to get more money so that they can um, fix all their transmission slides too. They had a lack of transparency with the funds spent and little oversight by asset managements. So here's a picture of what an insulator looks like on those, one of those giant transmission lines. Um, this right here, it helps stabilize the voltage throughout that whole thing. And if obviously if this is falling apart, then the amount of voltage that goes through that system becomes too critical. And hence that's why you have random wires that just simply can't take on that load and that, that current throughout that whole transmission line and stuff just keeps falling apart. And the, like, Every single part within a transmission line is very critical and vital to the whole system functioning properly. And if we have little insulators like this just going astray, then obviously we have a problem here. And I wanted to show these two pictures between what a transmission line and a distribution line is. So those giant transmission lines are what you see going through the coast of California. Those carry those lar very large voltages that you see, which will cause you know, those huge like electricity arcs that you, um, you might have seen in videos and stuff like that. And what the company was trying to do back in uh, 2012 was take those giant transmission lines and try to shut them off by converting them with distribution lines. Those distribution lines simply just aren't meant for those, those types of voltages, those very high low voltages. So right then and there, you know, that, that is a giant problem if you're going to travel hundreds upon hundreds of miles with that load, that type of load, and you just give it, you know, a small distribution line rather than a transmission line. It just seems like you're bleeding the system and you're going to have future problems. And then last but not least, another um, problem that I found while throughout my, um, my research was some of the rug, the terrain was literally built on sides of mountains. And it's literally just not even smart to send a lineman to go risk his life in some some like very hard terrain to get up into those those transmission lines so a lot of the things got tabled for this specific reason and i want to show that there's a lot of brush on, on the side of this mountain right next to transmission lines that were poorly placed so um an ever-changing climate you know you, these are specific things that you have to look for the ethical issues of the situation can be split into two main parts. Deferred maintenance, which is when pg and &E pushes aside upgrading or replacing their equipment, and vegetation management when trees are not maintained and grow into power lines. So that both are about the company's overall negligence with following safety protocols. There have been many wildfires that occurred because pg and &E was inattentive with how they should have been handling equipment that needed to be replaced 
pg e executives tend to push these concerns aside because they think of them as part of low risk projects. They want to focus on higher priority projects that would give them more profits and the company was being irresponsible and did not make changes to their power systems when necessary. For the wildfire that happened in the town of Paradise, it was reported that pg e knew for years about how their equipment was faulty and that it could start a fire but they dismissed public safety and let the risk of fire increase day after day. Almost 50 of the steel towers in the transmission system were past their useful life and needed to be replaced, but pg e continued to be irresponsible and a wildfire resulted from it, killing almost 100 people. If we look at the data from the transmission system, the towers averaged at 68 years old when the mean life expectancy was 65 years. There were even towers that were over 100 years old. That information alone is enough to understand pg e negligence. The other issue pg e failed to attend were the trees growing around their power systems. As you can see in the picture, that tree is very close to the power lines and the state law requires that companies maintain specific clearances between vegetation and power lines. At least one tree in nearly half of pg e projects violated the law. When pg e actually tried to regulate the vegetation, Workers who were responsible for keeping track of the trees growing towards the power lines, they marked them as safe. So those trees that needed to be trimmed or removed were passed as safe. What we can take from that is pg and &E should be properly expecting, um, inspecting the vegetation near the power lines. They need to enforce rules to prevent the dangers of wildfires breaking out. That way, the company should be abiding by the state laws and the trees would meet safety requirements. But pg e already had a history of not correctly monitoring the situation, writing down the wrong things, and even going as far as fabricating reports. This brings us to the code of ethics that are set for engineers. Uh, this one's quite long, but the important part is the last sentence. To disclose promptly factors that might endanger the public or the environment. The public had no idea about the quality of the equipment being used to supply them power, and they didn't know that some of the equipment, actually more than some, needed to be replaced. If they didn't know about that, they wouldn't know about any of the risks that would um, happen with using older equipment, uh, like the ones that were past their useful life in the transmission system in the town of Paradise. pg and &E prioritized profits over the safety of the public by disregarding the efforts and costs for replacing the equipment. The NSP Code of Ethics states that engineers shall conform with state registration laws in the practice of engineering. This relates to the vegetation around power lines that did not abide to state laws. The trees were not properly trimmed when necessary or were not removed when they possessed a greater risk. By state law, the surrounding vegetation were to maintain a specific distance from the power lines. But because pg and &E refused to stand by those rules, wildfires broke out and the trees came into contact with the power lines. Lives would have been saved and homes would not have been burned down if pg and &E properly followed the law. All right. Um, is there anything the country's 10th biggest utility system could have done to re uh, reduce its wildfire risk? Um, well, maybe. Um, other utility companies across the country have fortified, updated, and protected their power delivery systems. And I'm just going to explain how they do that. Um, one of the most obvious changes is to beef up physical infrastructure, which is called uh, hardening the grid. So high winds, snow, branches, and, and much more can damage wires and poles, increasing the risk of fires and outages. This goes for dry climates, especially in California, where a historic drought preceded megafires in 2018, like the one in uh, Paradise. Southern states are exposed to high winds during hurricane se season, and much of the Northwest and Midwest are subject to heavy snowstorms. Uh, grid hardening looks different in different parts of the country, but experts uh, recommend PG&E bury their power lines underground out of the way of the branches. Uh, for example, Duke Energy has buried sections of their uh, lines that are particularly vulnerable, uh, which they call this uh, targeted undergrounding. Uh, however, the cost of burying power lines underground is enormous and it would ultimately fall on customers. Other less expensive updates include replacing wood poles with stronger and more fire resistant concrete, steel, or fiber, uh, fiberglass poles, making poles taller so uh, that sur uh, surrounding trees have less of a chance of landing on wires if a tree falls and insulating power lines with plastic material that uh, protects the line. Uh, the next option is to deploy technologies uh, that gather information and automate uh, safety uh, some safety responses. Um, these technologies are varied and a lot of utilities are already uh, deploying them. 
Uh, next slide, please. You guys, uh, uh, your, your time is up, so just uh, kind of just wrap it up real quick. Okay, uh, San Diego, uh, that's fine. Uh, continue. You want? Do you want me to go back or just do the conclusion? Oh, yeah, we could just go over the key points real quick. Um, okay. So basically, we said the pg and &E line was caused the deadliest fire, and um, they're obviously a big uh, company since 1984, and they've been in, in and out of lawsuits since then, and they've been filing for bankruptcy. They chose to ignore this problem, and they had a history of falsifying reports, and uh, generally that leads to their projects being poorly mismanaged and maintained. Next slide. And uh, at the end of the day, they chose the company's bottom line over the safety of the public, and they chose to disregard state laws. And they could have just added um, like new fiberglass poles, cameras, and um, emergency shutoff to um, Ajit, I can't hear you. Oh, okay. But well, uh, okay. Before did they stop at? Sorry. Um, it was shut off options. Oh, all yeah, right. So dead shut off options. Uh, that could be deployed with um, different uh, technologies, and uh, basically, they could um have better policy to um help their problems out. So that's about it. Great. Thank you for listening. All right. Thank you so much. Great, thanks guys. Thank you. All right, so uh, so it looks like everyone from the Fukushima group is here. Uh, so why don't you guys go ahead and get set up. Um, and so uh, so wildfire groups, um, so there's um, there's a, an assignment on Canvas right now where you can turn in your slides, but it's not due until Friday. So anytime, if you wanna to touch up the slides until then, um, you can you can go ahead and do that. Um, and then I'll, 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 I'll give you your, your grade after you turn in the, the slides. Okay, okay oh, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so next group we have uh, Fukushima. And so uh, whenever you guys are ready, uh, you guys can go ahead. Okay, I think we're ready now. So the Fukushima nuclear accident, go to the next slide. So the introduction, in this report, we'll run you through some context like the history, technical background, economic costs, and personnel involved. We also cover the ethics and analyze the ethical dilemma brought forth from the disaster, and we'll cover the impact behind the ethical choices made, and finally find an alternative course of action and what future situations can look like. Next slide. For the historical context, Japan lies aligning the alleged Pacific Ring of Fire, which is one of the most volatile belts that generates turmoil. Harming earthquakes routinely brings about waves happen a couple of times <coughs> every century. Notwithstanding the conflict of the mainland plates, Japan Trench is another reason of Japan's various turmoil. Japan is situated in the Circum Pacific zone in which particularly all the volcanoes of the world are focused. For the technical context, at the point when the quake hit, rectors were working in the struck Miyagi area under four plants. Generator framework stopped working because of the wave following tumor, which is overpowered generator system causing power shortage. Hydrogen was provided by the nuclear Richter pressure vessels, causing micro explosions in the structure of Richter's units number one, three, and four that influenced buildings and structures nearby and devastated stuff. For the economic context, cause direct monetary means misfortune of 211 billion US dollar, including lodging, framework, and inhalation, and other resource misfortunes. The Legislature of Japan at first assessed the immediate harm between 16 trillion yen and 25 trillion yen. Approximately 30 billion dollars were stimulated in reparation of the, uh, to the 84,000 84, Fukushima power plant incident refugees. Personnel. So who were the Sorry, um, to stop myself from embarrassment of pronunciation, I've listed the three names here on the screen. These men were the only people brought to the Japanese court to be held responsible for the Fukushima tragedy. 
This short list contains the chairman of TEPCO at the time and the two vice presidents of the company and leaders of the nuclear division. Remarkably, none of these men were held criminally responsible for what happened. Next slide. So now we get to the Fukushima 50 and who they were. This was the name given to the 50 brave workers that had stayed behind to best control the reactors as they were failing. Uh, one notable figure is that uh, of Mr. Yoshida, a nuclear engineer and general manager for TEPCO's nuclear department. He is a man who stood up to his superiors to disobey any orders to stop using seawater to cool the reactors. This disobedience was later acknowledged by a nuclear physicist as a decision that arguably prevented a much worse outcome. He is an incredibly brave man who sadly died in 2013 from cancer at the age of 58. Next slide. So I'm going to be talking about the Kyoto Cold decisions that happened during the Fukushima disaster. So back in 2008, the Tokyo Electrical Power Company, also known as TEPCO, decided not to build a higher seawall surrounding the Fukushima Daiichi plant, although they knew the risk. This was because they didn't want to have or consider the financial cost of building it, so they ignored it. And during the disaster, the Japanese government decided to withhold or limit the information of the disaster to the public. This was most likely to secure time to save their own reputations because they could not react properly to the disaster. Also, they, the government decided to, uh, to favor political and financial connections over the people. And those financial connections and political connections were people such as the nuclear village. And to give, to give context, the nuclear village were a group of pro-nuclear government officials and various members from the Nuclear and Safety and Industrial Safety Agency, also known as NISA and TEPCO itself. They just wanted to secure more party favors and political funding by assuming some responsibility and trying to take account to take action and try to be heroes, but in the end, it didn't work out. As previously discussed during the disaster, TEPCO and the Prime Minister rejected Masao Yoshida's idea to pump seawater into the reactors, which were less than the effects of the disaster. But Yoshida would then ignore them and continue pumping seawater, regardless of the cost. So next slide. The decisions following the Fukushima disasters have broken many code of ethics, especially one of the most important code of holding paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public which is both present in, in the IE and NSP, NPSE Code of Ethics. As previously discussed, the government had limited the information of the situation to the public. And this had caused delays to, to evacuation orders and these evacuation orders would then become vague and confusing instructions for people. And that led to people being in danger and even caused deaths. Next slide. Also mentioned before, oh, the impacts of it, the decision made, costed the Japanese government around $200 billion and caused around 2,000 deaths. And these 2,000 deaths were a result of poor evacuation orders given by the government because people had no idea where to go and given to place and we were ordered to evacuate to places that were deemed more dangerous than they should be. As a result, the public decide, or the public distrust increased towards the government because they had no idea what was going on in this time of crisis. Other countries decided, have started to critique the pan-tandling of the situation, including countries such as the US and G Germany, as they took initiatives to save their own people that were living in Japan at the moment by ordering their own evacuation orders. Uh, next slide. Opposing political factions would take this disasters by react, reacting negatively to the current prime ministers or the prime minister Naoto Kan. And as a result, his approval ratings had dropped below 20 or dropped below 30%, and then his disapproval ratings, disapproval ratings have skyrocketed. And this would be one of the, I could see in the graph that 
it shows how his approval ratings went down while his disapprovals, disapproval ratings went up. And this would be one of the several factors of the prime minister at the time to resign only a few months after the disaster had occurred. He was only in office for about a year. Uh, next slide. One of the most important course of action that could have been ta that could have been taken was to follow the international best practice for nuclear reactor safety, such as installing the higher seawalls three years prior to the disaster instead of rejecting the proposal to do so. Beforehand, the previously mentioned nuclear village would ignore several warnings about uh, from other nuclear engineers around the world about more problems arising the Fukushima plant, but they decided not to, to do anything about it. If they were to, just to follow the, the orders or suggestion to build a higher seawall, this would have been in comply with the code of ethics of holding the safety of the public as it would protect the engineers and, prob and probably reduce the severity of the disaster. And next slide. Outlook for future situations. So 2011 is definitely a learning experience in terms of structure, location, and safety. But if a similar situation were to occur, it would most likely reinforce the idea that nuclear energy is not the way to go. Somehow countries would have to come up with new technology or other instruments to reduce carbon emission that may be costly and require time. As for the public, they were fearful for their health, family, and homes if they live near one, and this is mainly because of the misleading information from the media that ranked plants based on partial knowledge that they had. Next slide. All right, so in conclusion, the Fukushima nuclear disaster is one that kicked the nation while it was already down, resulting in over 100,000 evacuations and the potential harm of long-term radiation exposure affecting an estimated 32 million people. With a conservative estimated cost of 200 billion US dollars for damages and cleanup, this is one of the greatest nuclear failures of our time and possibly for all of history. Despite this meltdown being referred to as an accident in many cases, the truth is this event was entirely preventable had the people in charge of TEPCO and Japan's Nuclear and Industrial Safety Agency had followed the more strict international safety guidelines. This disaster is the perfect case study to demonstrate what happens when companies and agencies become complacent with the work they've already accomplished and disregard the warnings of what's to come. All right, that's it. Great, great, thanks guys. Yeah, that was good. Okay, um, and so same thing for you guys. So if you wanna to touch up your slides a bit more, you can go ahead and turn it in by the end of the week. Um, but if not, you can you can just go ahead and submit it now. Um, just Only just one person in your group needs to submit the, the slides. Okay, um, so our next group is gonna be on uh, Facebook and digital privacy. So is everyone from that group, uh, everyone from that group here? I believe so. Okay. Um, okay. Great. You guys are, are set to go. So uh, whenever you guys are ready, you can uh, you can go ahead and start. Okay. Hello, everyone. Our case study was about the Facebook Cambridge uh, Analytica scandal. Slide. Uh, this case involved two major companies, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. These are some of the memes you may recognize from the event. Slide. Um, <clears throat> everyone that uses a platform similar to Facebook, like. Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok have their data somehow saved there with companies. What company, new companies have realized is that this data can be used to their own benefit. That is why data has become a great asset, in fact, a more valuable asset than oil. <clears throat> companies are finding new ways to extract this data, bypassing user policies, getting their hands on your precious data. But an important question is how far should companies be controlling your data? This case is relevant because scant the scandal revealed how unethical Cambridge Analytica's methods were for using and acquiring data. This brought to light the issue we face today. How can we f solve the issue involving misuse of data? Slide. Historical context. Next slide. 
Um, initially, Facebook was a service created in 2004 for Harvard students to use as a social media platform where students can share their daily college lives between one another. <coughs> as the popularity of the service grew, it spread from school to school and eventually became worldwide. In 2006, Facebook began to advertise products for other companies. At the, <coughs> sorry. At the same time, Facebook was constantly releasing new features. This included their application program interface or API where third-party software developers can create apps for the users to use directly through the service. For features Facebook developed, data privacy was not prioritized. Their newsfeed feature showed friends every change the user made on their profile and their beacon feature allowed friends to see products to, to see products the user purchases from advertised companies. Next slide. In 2016, the US presidential election was being held between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Later, Facebook would be exposed for a scandal regarding data privacy where personally identifiable information of up to 87 million people was harvested, harvested by a third party company, Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica is a political consulting firm that, uses, that used Facebook's API to create a personality quiz app called this is your life digital. This is your digital life. The data can that can be gained from this app included the user's profile information, history, posts they liked, some private messages, and their friends list. Cambridge used this harvested data to expose victims of, to pro-Trump advertisements tailored to their personality and likes. As a result, Cambridge tried to influence the U.S. presidential election in an unethical way. Next slide. Okay, so I'll be talking about the technical context of this scandal. So essentially, there were no engineering aspects. Sorry, I thought it was unmuted. Could you guys hear me? Yeah, you're good now. Okay. Um, so essentially, there were no engineering aspects involved in the scandal. However, in this case, Facebook heavily relied on the code written by computer scientists and the terms and service that users gave consent to. So essentially, cybersecurity is a measure taken to be protected against criminal use of electronic data. And cybersecurity is highly class classified information, obviously, since companies wouldn't want hackers to hack in easily. But um, I'll go ahead and go into the app technical aspects of what actually happened in here. So Alexander Kogan, who is a co-founder of Global Science Research, decided to ask users to download this app called This Is Your Digital Life in exchange for money, right? Who wouldn't do that? Who wouldn't fill out a survey uh, for money? So when people went ahead and did that, Kogan took the data and he sent it to CEO Alexander Nix of Cambridge Analytica, which was illegal. It was violating Facebook's platform policies. So um, uh, that's essentially the technical aspect. I do wanna share one example, however, of cybersecurity that Facebook uses, um, which is called shadow profiles. Essentially, ghost profiles are created of non-Facebook users with a name, face, phone number, email address, whatever. Um, and this is done when you agree to connect your contact list to Facebook, right? So a lot of people uh, agree to connect their contacts so they can find their friends on Facebook. But once you do that and your contact, you know, someone from your contact does not have a Facebook account, Facebook creates a shadow profile of their account. So people who do not even have an account are on Facebook. And all Mark Elliott Zuckerberg had to say about this was that, you can download all of your, the data that Facebook stores. And he still says that, right? This is still an issue with Facebook, that people who do not agree are still having their information sent to Facebook. Um, with that being said, I'll go ahead and pass on the slide to Jose. Hello, so for the economic section, I didn't find any info if Alexander Kogan's app was sold to Cambridge Analytica. Most articles just mentioned that he passed on the data to Cambridge Analytica or he ended up working with them. But the data they did gather was sold for profit. Since Cambridge Analytica was a political consulting firm, it sold its services to campaign groups. Two of these campaign groups were the Ted Cruz campaign and the Donald Trump's campaign. It was reported by the Federal Election Commission that they paid Cambridge Analytica $5.8 million and $5.9 million, respectively. 
they do mention in articles that Cambridge Analytica also worked with Brexit campaigns, but they were pro bono. Next slide. Following the outbreak, um, following the news outbreak, Facebook stock fell by almost $134 billion. Uh, the year after the scandal, their net income decreased by 16.4%. Next slide. In the, after, in the aftermath, they also had to pay fines in both Europe and the United States. In Europe, they paid about 500,000 pounds, which is equivalent to $643,000. And in the United States, they had to pay 5 billion. At the time, this was the highest fine for a company for violating consumers' privacy. This led to Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg to pledge more than 3.7 billion on safety and security. Next slide. For the personal um, context, the people involved were Alexander Kogan and Alexander Nix. Alexander Kogan was the one that created the app called This Is Your Digital Life. And on this app, people answer questions involving personality and behavioral. About 270,000 people used the app. And from the loophole Facebook had, about 80 million users, users were affected. Kogan launched this app initially under the guise of academic research. And that's how he got around the loophole. Alexander Nix was the CEO of Cambridge Analytica. And he used the company to help on the Brexit campaigns, uh, like I mentioned, pro bono. He also claimed credit for the success of the Brexit and Donald Trump's presidency. Uh, lastly, the companies involved were Cambridge Analytica and Facebook. Next slide. So what happened to Cambridge Analytica? Um, from both companies, Cambridge had the most to lose. There was uh, a whistleblower named Christopher Wiley that exposed the inner workings of the company and how they used the data harvested from Facebook to help on the campaign elections. An example of this was the creation of the slogans like Drain the Swamp and Build the Wall being used as early as 2014. At the, end of the, at the end of this, Cambridge Analytica was the only one that went bankrupt. And for Alexander Kogan and Alexander Nix, they were restricted on how to conduct future businesses. Thank you. Next slide. I will cover the ethical dilemma. Next slide. Uh, so Facebook and Cambridge Analytica had their own issues that they violated the code of ethics. Uh, for starters, NSP E section two, subsection one, part C, engineers shall not reveal facts, data, information without the prior consent of the client or employee. And IEEE code for section one, to accept responsibility in making engineering decisions consistent with the safety, health, and welfare of the public, and to disclose promptly factors that might endanger the public or the environment. Facebook saw the issues that the app was ha that was obtained by Cambridge Analytica had with pro uh, accessing personal information of users, but did not say anything to users or notify them of any issues until news outlets reported on this. Next slide. Uh, IEEE section two, to avoid real or perceived conflicts of interest whenever possible and to disclose them to affected parties when they do exist in NSPE section two, subsection four, part A, engineers shall disclose all known potential or potential conflicts of interest that could influence or appear to influence the judgment or the quality of their services. Given that Facebook is a business and their job isn't really to monitor users or applications, but it's to increase their user base and the traffic to the site, they weren't really displaying the fact that they really don't care as much about what might happen to the data. They only care about getting more user base for the bottom line of money. Uh, next slide. Uh, IEEE section seven, to seek, accept, and offer honest criticism of technical work to acknowledge and correct errors and to credit properly the contributions of others and NSPE section three, subsection one, part A, engineers shall acknowledge their errors and shall not distort alter facts. Instead of looking into the issues that were brought up by other companies, uh, by companies reporting on the scandal, they instead decided to sue them instead of you know, trying to work out and see if there's any merit to what they said. Next slide. Uh, for Cambridge Analytica, it's NSPE section one, subsection one, part C, and IEEE code for section one. Uh, once they got the app from Kogan, they didn't try and authorize future consent from users, and they instead utilized this loophole that they got. Um, IEEE Section 2 and NSPE Section 2, Subsection 4, Part A. Um, given that they're a political consulting firm, they have a massive conflict of interest where they're not really trying to ethically work out how to get information. If they have it, they're going to use it so they can sell it to political campaigns. Next slide. Uh, NSPE Section 1, Part 5, shall avoid deceptive acts. Section 1, Part 6, shall conduct themselves honorably, responsibly, ethically, and lawfully so as to enhance the honor, reputation, and youthfulness of the profession. And Section 3, Subsection 3, Part A, engineers shall avoid the use of statements containing a material misrepresentation of fact or omitting a material fact. Um, they utilize this loophole trying to funnel as much information as they could and utilize that later. Facebook had... Um, 
had them formally certified that they deleted all the information, but they later found out that Cambridge Analytica kept it all. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then for ethical issues, we have the different impacts. So monetarily, Facebook stock fell around 24%, but they actually recovered most, they covered all their losses within a few months. Uh, Facebook was fined by the UK commissioner's office, uh, 64,000, 640,000, sorry. And the Federal Trade Commission voted three to two to fine Facebook $5 billion to settle their investigation. Next slide. Uh, for the public, this spawned a de hashtag delete Facebook uh, with the goal of boycotting Facebook with WhatsApp founder actually voicing support and deleting the platform in general. Uh, a survey, though, done uh, found that 84% of Facebook users had concerns about their data use in the app, but of, of those uh, surveyed, only 40 actually said that they would reduce their Facebook usage. Uh, Facebook saw a 20% drop in likes, posts, and shares, uh, but despite that, the user base increased by 1.8% over the re most recent quarter. Uh, next slide. Uh, additionally to that, uh, a U, uh, Unicred, uh, an Italian banking company, ceased all advertising markets, marketing on Facebook, citing that they had uh, unethical business practices. Uh, and India and Brazil actually demanded a report of any of the cis, uh, their respective citizens who have, whose data was collected and utilized. Next slide. Uh, for the media, the Guardian, Re Guardian reported about Ted Cruz uh, using Cambridge Analytica for his campaign in 2016. Uh, and the of fact uh, talked about how uh, Trump paid around $6 million to Cambridge for his 2016 campaign. Uh, and Christopher Wiley, the uh, whistleblower, worked uh, with the Observer for over a year before they turned to New York Times so they could report to us in the U.S., and this scandal actually helped to create a Netflix documentary, The Great Hack, which is uh, pretty great in showing how everything interconnects and showing through de several different perspectives. Next slide. Uh, as a response, Mark Zuckerberg apologized on behalf of Facebook, uh, putting a, a publishing letter to various newspapers. Uh, he also pledged to make reform reforms um, to prevent further breaches, implementing the EU's general data protection regulation in all regions, and created Social Science One, uh, which is a collaboration to see how election democracy are affected by social media. Next slide. Uh, in aftermath, uh, Cambridge Analytica closed all operations. Uh, Cambridge Analytica was liquidated along with other companies uh, uh, where they moved and made new companies like Emerald Data Limited. And the owners of Cambridge and SLC made the company in such a way that employees were dispersed between these companies and that the C CEOs and owners were acquired by Emerald Data. Uh, a professor, David Carroll, sued Cambridge for unlawfully liquidating before the inv investigation could be fully performed and believed that the acquisition was just to conceal the scandal further. SOC Group uh, was given injury, criminal injury, and a $26,000 fine, but they did not find unlawful to liquidate. Next slide. Uh, as a speculation, uh, we don't really know since it's still kind of unfolding and we haven't seen the full reaches of it throughout the industry. Uh, but the idea would be, or the belief would be, that uh, this will expand expectation responsibility for companies like Facebook and widen their scope because uh, they'll need to protect their users from malicious entities and maybe work with the government in the future. Uh, this also shows where the law leans in certain future court cases, and there may be a shift for all companies to adopt the EU's general protection uh, regulation. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Are there possible ethical choices? So. One alternative solution was Facebook regulating their API since it was created. Uh, those are the two co ethical codes that basically say that there should be uh, sustainable development practices and applicable standards. And that, and um, by Facebook can follow this by checking and monitoring every software before it goes through, the, through their API, such as checking if the type of data obtained is appropriate for that company or program and some strictness of the API that uh, Facebook implemented after the scandal was turning off an app's access to users' data if the person hasn't used the app in the last three months, reviewing all apps that have had access to large amounts of data on its platform and apps with suspicious activity, and limiting the type of data all API apps can access. If Facebook had implemented these changes or these uh, strictness in their API when it was created, the companies like Cambridge couldn't have easily manipulated their system. Next slide. 
All right, you guys are out of time, so uh, so go ahead and, and just try to wrap it up really quickly. Just a brief uh, recap. Uh, so essentially in 2014, Facebook uh, made the news public. And so in late 2015 is when uh, Facebook asked Cambridge Analytica to delete all the data. And then in 2018, Facebook released their new privacy terms. And it's always recommended not to use Facebook to log into other social media sites. Um, employees are always made aware of the most common breaches so that Facebook isn't hacked and they tell you to avoid using your personal email on work computers. Um, and so thank you everybody for your time. We appreciate it. Great. Yeah, thank you guys. Okay, um, so our next group is gonna be the Deepwater Horizon group. So, uh, so you guys can go ahead and get set up for that. Um, I just wanna make sure everyone's on my team's ready. Uh, are you ready? I'm good. Yes, can everybody yes. hear us? All right. All right. Yeah, whenever you guys are ready, I'll start the timer when you guys uh, start talking. All right. All right. Uh, so, can you see my screen? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so, we're doing Deepwater Horizon. We have uh, Ricardo Sasanto, Sean Cho, Amy Guzman, Ton Pham, and Caleb Walker. So, as an intro, uh, Deepwater Horizon is an ultra submersible offshore drilling rig. It was owned by TransOcean and leased to BP Oil from 2001 to 2013. It's known for drilling some of the deepest oil wells going up to 35,000 feet. Uh, some of the problems that we'll talk about are the executives try to cut a lot of corners due to budget constraints and having a lot of scheduling delays. Uh, the explosion took place on April 20th, 2010, and we'll talk about all the events leading up to it. And uh, the, what ended up happening was 4.2 million barrels of oil leaked into the Gulf of Mexico. And it's one of the largest, it's the largest oil spill in the history of marine oil drilling. Go ahead, Sean. Um, Macondo Well, I'm going to talk about the British Petroleum Oil Spill. It's a 49 miles off the Louisiana coast, the largest oil reservoirs in the Gulf of Mexico. 2008, BP paid $34 million to drill the area. Then it is all about the money for them. They list the rig from the Transocean Coast approximately 500,000 a day plus a similar uh, amount of contractor fee. It is very close to the million dollars per day. The first drilling was made at the Macondo Well in 2009 by Marina's fleet owned by uh, Transocean. However, it was towed for the service due to the Hurricane Ida. But finally, 2010, Deep Water Horizon, the another uh, Transocean Ocean's fleet arrived at the well January 2010 uh, and started drilling February. Deep Water Horizon was an explore, exploratory vessel. It was, uh, it was to close the well temporarily and return with the another rig. However, every work was behind the schedule about the 30 days. Next. Uh, now I want to show the movie scenes describe the, describing the day of blowout, uh, April 10, uh, from the Water Horizon release in 2016. At the very beginning of the movie, uh, a installation manager from the Transocean so that the Schulenberger engineering team were leaving the rig without any conducting the record test. He found that they were sent home by BP. It was around 10 a.m. Uh, on the day around 5 p.m., he did not accept the BP's decision, so he performed the negative test to confirm any leaks inside the well uh, with the supervisor from the BP, but there was unexpected test result. However, the BP pushed the schedule because he does not want to stop the work. Uh, finally, around 9.30 p.m., when the work resumed, uh, the water horizon explo exploded. By the accident, 11 people were killed and 70 were injured. To sum up, uh, BP did not want to work to be postponed for any other reasons, and their series of, series of wrong decisions caused the disaster.
All right, technical context. Engineering fields involved in offshore drilling are mechanical, chemical, petroleum, civil, and environmental. Mechanical engineers design, develop, install, and maintain equipment, and they also focus on safety and make sure that everything complies with company and industry safe standards. Chemical engineers make sure that correct chemicals are used to convert crude oil into usable oil, and they also ensure that the extracted petroleum or oil make it into the gas tanks. Petroleum engineers develop plans and different ways to inject water chemical gases or anything else into the reservoirs to help recover the oil. They, they also help with the design of the equipment used to extract. Civil engineers help maintain structural integrity and help in the design of major projects. And environmental engineers help improve recycling, waste disposal, public health, and pollution control using engineering and scientific principles. Next. Okay, challenging technical aspects. Some of the different technical aspects involved are, I don't know how to pronounce that word, azimuth thrusters, I guess I would say, which are propellers that can rotate in any horizontal angle. Blow preventers, which are mechanical devices used to seal, control, and monitor wells. We also have pressure and drill monitoring systems. For example, the e-drill system, which was used to monitor drill equipment in real time from onshore. We also have cement modeling and automated shutoff systems. Next. Sorry, I'm doing the economic context. So in 2001, Transocean received the Deepwater Horizon oil rig for an estimated 340 million. Afterwards, they signed a leasing contract with Deepwater or with BP Oil. BP Oil. The next bullet points are how many times they renewed contracts with uh, Deep uh, with Transocean. 2004, they renewed for a year. In 2005, for five years. And in 2009. They leased, a, uh, they renewed an extension that lasted through 2013. Reportedly, uh, from experts, uh, leasing the services of an oil rig costs about a million dollars a day to run them. Uh, some other notes about the company's Transocean uh, was in the dominant position of all oil distribution refineries because uh, in 2007 they merged with the rival Global Santa Fe. Uh, in 2009, their global, feet, uh, their global fleet produced revenues of $11.6 billion, and BP Oil uh, was the fourth largest corporation based on revenue, producing more than 4 million barrels of oil daily. This is an uh, image of uh, how much oil uh, was being produced uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, and around the years in the uh, nine, 1990s, uh, the oil companies started looking into using deep, uh, deep oil rigging. And so that's when uh, the amount of oils, uh, the amount of barrels of oil almost tripled in production. And also the rising costs uh, were going up for barrels. And in, 2000, in around 2004, uh, they started looking into ultra deep oil rigging, such as like deep water horizon oil rigs. In March 2008, BP uh, spent $34 million to get a certain block of sea where they were going to mine oil in the Gulf of Mexico. On April 20th, uh, they were six weeks behind schedule and $58 million over budget. And so they started cutting corners. They wanted to replace the heavy mud with light seawater to keep uh, well pressure down. And on April 20th, uh, they sent the team of cement inspection people home early which would have saved them $128,000. And at 9.30 p.m. that night, Deepwater Horizon exploded. And in subsequent days, BP's share price lost 54% on New York Stock Exchange, which is emphasized in the image in the uh, year 2010. So in 2012, uh, uh, they, uh, BP Oil had to pay $4.5 billion 
and criminal fees uh, for the 11 deaths. Under the, uh, under the Clean Water Act, uh, the judge uh, uh, made them pay the, uh, uh, the most expensive fee of $4,300 per barrel spilled. And in court, BP claimed it was 2.5 billion million barrels of oil, but the judge claimed it was 4.2 million, million barrels of oil that spilled into the Gulf of Mexico. BP had to settle a bunch of uh, uh, disputes with local economy. They paid 9.2 billion to some of the economies, uh, business, fishermen, hotels, and they had to put $20 billion in, into a trust for the businesses. Uh, and so overall, BP announced that their estimated losses was $61.6 billion. And the US claimed that overall, the entire US lost about $145.93 billion over uh, because of the oil spill. All right, yeah, personal context. So that's, um, we said in the introduction, BP uh, leaves the deep water rig from uh, Transocean. So most of the crew that worked on the rig were actually from the uh, Transocean companies, um, not actual BP employees. Um, so the operator fails to uh, inquire the engineers on staff. So there were a group of engineers uh, that were visiting the rig. Um, they did not inform them about the uh, negative pressure test. So X, X said mud was blowing up the pipe and the kill line would clock and went undetected. Um, of course, the uh, visiting engineer could have told the operator to halt the operation if, if they knew about the issues. Um, so we have two names here, uh, Don Vindrins and uh, Kaluza, and they were the two supervisors that were in charge of the, at the time of the incident, and they were BP employees, not uh, Transocean. Um, so what like we mentioned before, um, the, the rig was uh, over budgets and, and um, behind schedule, so they just get the uh, operators the, the green light to go ahead and, and continue with the drilling uh, despite the negative test um, pressure testing. Next, please. So BP workers were under pressure to amp up production because they were under budgets and, and um, I mean, they were over budgets and uh, under production and even the managers were under pressure and just the company as a whole wanted to make more money um, in order to you know, pay for the lease and, and all the fees. Next. So after further investigation, they were cutting corners. Um, the cement, uh, the cementing uh, up the well were not um, up to standards and they were not able to, to plug the well. Uh, BP was aware of the issue, but you know, along with the uh, third party, the company, uh, Halley Burton that, that did the uh, cementing, they just um, uh, ignored the issues. And then additionally, the blown, blown out protectors were malfunctioning. Uh, instead of using a third party um, inspect, inspection company to uh, inspect the, um, all the safety measures, they just use their own uh, people. That way it's easier for them to just um, cut corners. Next. Sean? Oh, Sorry, is... I was mute. Uh, there, there were a lot of ethical labs uh, leading to the disaster. The first, uh, they had to choose what casing method to extract the oil. Uh, first, uh, left figure. So it, 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 it is called the linear. It uses a short steel casing uh, and it allows a lower material cost and a great flexibility. And the right one, it is called the casing string. Uh, it is kind of opposite. It provides a pressure integrity and a secure system. The case string method was planned originally, uh, but uh, they changed it due to the additional time and the cost uh, of seven to ten million million dollars. Even though the calculation and simulation indicate the risk of unreliable cementing work with the linear that they ignore. Uh, next, second before blowouts they obtained a good result. 
from other tests. However, uh, some results were manipulated by the corrected input, like uh, scheming for what BP was interested in only. So based on the numbers uh, from the test, BP decided to skip the cement evaluation test. Uh, it is called the cement bond logs. Uh, with the decision, they lose the chance to check cement and the other systems settle down properly and securely. And last one, on the day of blows out, the negative test showed unreal, unexplained test result. However, BP supervisor ignored the sign to save the time. Okay, I'll be going over the analysis of the ethical dilemma. So we're gonna start off with the conflict. So basically the conflict was that BP wanted to, uh, you know, dig to 20,000, 200 feet of the Gulf of Mexico because they they wanted to explore the the geology of it and they thought they would find a big oil and gas reservoir and so there was three compromises that came along with it which would be the amount of uh, mud that was removed the cementing and flow rate process and the nitrogen foam cement so basically one the first one there was not enough mud removed um, well by the cap and also the second one the flow rate of the cement was too slow which uh, was allowing slow allowing for the mud to displace the cement a faster flow rate could potentially damage the structure but could be more secure if it settles but they decided to go with the slow flow rate and also the third one the executives uh, um, elected to use the nitrogen foam cement which infused nitrogen into the you know mix producing small bubbles formations in the cement making it lighter but more likely to break and then uh, we're just gonna jump to the interest of the company versus the public bp was very irresponsible they preferred to go with the interest of the company. They wanted to take the shortcuts. They didn't want to do the right thing. Next slide, please. Okay, and then we go to, is it a violation or is it not a violation? So we have both uh, codes of ethics for IEEE and the National Society of Professional Engineers. Uh, we'll start with the first one. Accordingly, the services provided by the engineers require honesty, uh, impartiality, fairness, and equity, and must be dedicated to the protection of the public health, safety, and welfare, which we know did not happen. They didn't even, as Sean mentioned, they didn't even let the engineers inspect the area. They just told them to like basically go home. So they weren't even being responsible. Professor, did you want me to stop or are we okay? You, got, you guys are uh, over time, but uh, so if you can kind of uh, wrap it up. You guys can get, can get to the conclusion, just uh, maybe just go quickly. Okay. Uh, do you want to present our so impacts and fallout? Um, okay, so basically, I guess the impacts and fallouts were uh, a lot of people lost a lot of money due to tourism. You know, they couldn't fish and farm, and the BP chair executive got fired. So that just summarizes those ones real quick. And it affected other companies because it didn't. You know, like they weren't allowed to do offshore drilling for six months while President Obama put a, I don't know how to pronounce that word, monetary or something like that for six months. So, you know, basically that's it. <laughs> Everybody looked at BP. They didn't really judge the engineers. Uh, and then like something that they could prevent. So uh, I found that in the Pacific region, the oil facilities had five inspectors that can inspect 23 facilities. So one inspector for every five facilities, but in the Gulf of Mexico region, they had uh, one inspector responsible for 54 facilities and they'd have to visit those facilities every month. And so there wasn't enough people for one to inspect the places and they weren't uh, settling the fine. So the MMS, the Minerals Management Services, is uh, generates $23 billion in fines. And so they shouldn't, they never use that money wisely to uh, for, uh, to uh, have more uh, safety procedures or practice better management techniques. And so in the future, they should look to use that money for better purposes. And then these are all of our references. Thank you. Great, thanks guys. Okay, so it is uh, 2.09. Um, and so we uh, we're just about out of time. But if the uh, if the deep fakes groups, I know I know I told you guys to be ready to go today. And so if you guys don't mind staying a little bit after, just just the deep fakes. Okay. Groups, um, you know, if if you guys want to go today, because I, I know kind of the feeling of you know you expect to go today, and you know if you don't go, 
Um, so you guys, you guys can go, but you know, everyone else, I'm not going to keep you, you know, for the entire, oh, for yeah. over the time. So if you have to go, uh, go ahead and take off. So thank you everybody who presented today. Thank you everyone who came um, to the uh, presentation today and I'll see you guys on Thursday for the second half. But if you want to stick around and, and hear about deep fakes, you can, uh, you can stick around for that too. All right. So we're doing the deep fakes. Um, I'll be presenting the first few slides. My name is Kang and we got Kit, Darren, Aaron, and Sai presenting. Next slide, please. So introduction, what are deep fakes? Deep fakes are videos in which the original footage is altered and replaced with new audio to make it appear as though the subject is saying those words. The videos are constructed using multiple different algorithms and have been used for different purposes with variable intent. Next slide. So here's a quick video. I'm gonna show you guys an example. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. All right, so that's a little- We're entering an era, we're entering an era in which our- <laughs> uh, So for some historical context, um, so though the term deepfakes is fairly new, the idea and concept behind it has been <laughs> traced back to the 1990s. Sorry, somebody's making me laugh. Um, a video rewrite, though, is one of the first uh, programs that streamlined the process of integrating recorded audio and existing footage to have the footage resynced with new audio. This uh, program created a modified video done in two stages, the analysis stage and the synthesis stage. Next slide. Uh, the analysis stage uses facial recognition with old video footage called visual labeling and the associated audio called phoneme labeling to train the database to recognize facial patterns linked to particular phonemes and create a video model. In the synthesis stage, the new audio clip is partitioned to automatically choose triphones, a series of three phonemes from the video model. Though initially created for professional purposes, the video rewrite program has paved way for many other more technological advanced editing softwares and programs that may be used for malicious purposes, such as deep fakes. Deep fakes were for, was first implemented in 2017 by a Reddit user who aptly went by the name of deep fakes. They wrote an algorithm similar to the video rewrite algorithm to mess celebrity faces with pornographic videos. And that's how deep fakes got his name. So I'll pass it to the side. Oh, hello. I'll be presenting the technical context. So to create deepfake, it needs the involvement of computer scientists and software engineer. And in order to implement deepfake, um, artists are needed. So deepfakes is made using deep learning techniques and algorithm. If we look at figure one for machine learning, if a computer is fed enough pictures of cat, it will be able to learn in the simplest way if it is a cat or not a cat. And deep learning um, basically go to the next level. Once it learns enough about cat from videos, pictures, text, it will be able to identify the cat and filter out different type of breed of cat. Next slides. Oh. All right, so to implement deep fake, we're gonna need two person, person A and B, and then we want to swap persons A and B's face using two pairs of autoencoder. And what autoencoder is, is that it is used to train a computer using, en uh, using an encoder to deconstruct uh, a picture and then a decoder to reconstruct the image uh, as, a, as a type of training. So figure two is uh, best to demonstrate how autoencoder works. It will take an image, put it in the encoder and calculate a set of mathematical values and then use the decoder to translate that set of medical values back into pixels and then reconstruct the output image. And then figure three, demonstrate the process that happens um, for deep fakes. Um, the two auto encoder will deconstruct and reconstruct person A's and B's face at different angles with different facial expression, actions, and emotion until it fully learned the person's face. Then as you can see in the figure two, um, the, the two encoders share um, a network. 
so it can identify the similarities uh, of the facial structures on both person A and B. When the, when the face swapping process begins, it takes facial structure that is similar to person B from person A and then replace that facial structure onto person B, basically reconstructing face B from face A. Okay, so for the economic context, the actual cost of the deepfakes project is probably is that most likely unknown. So to estimate, I took the average machine learning engineer salaries in the United States to be around 145,000 a year, and I assumed five employees, so 61,000 per month of development. The average machine learning project is two months, so the total estimated cost for this project was around $141,000. So more so, it's more of the time consumption thing a no actual costs may have went into developing the code, but it's just the amount of time spent coding. So this coding was done by the Reddit user as Sai mentioned, deepfakes by Reddit user. And as technology improves, times will be spent on iterating the code because the code is open source. Uh, some personal context. So as I mentioned before, people who make the deepfake AI are computer engineers and artists. And uh, sorry, my dad's vacuuming. Okay, if you can hear that. But uh, people, people who create deep, the deepfakes is anyone who has access to the app since it is widely accessible now that almost pretty much anyone who has access to it can use it. And the people who make it, you know, they do it sometimes for blackmail or fiscal incentive. But sometimes they're used for good good things too, for like movie making and stuff. Um, the p people who use the deep fakes that are made are like media and posts on sites, and they like use it to either spread awareness or for fun or for th other uh, motives. People who are used in deep fakes are usually celebrities and political figures or even some random people, and they're great greatly affected because of like they can be their reputation and their and what they say can be altered so it can be put negative views on them um people people who also are greatly affected are the populace and the people who view the deep fakes so anyone who gets access to it when they see it on the media can cause people who see them to just believe whatever they see online and can lead them to spread and give out false information Next. So this technology clearly has the potential to be misused. The first deep fakes ever used were also the first to many to be used in unethical ways. So the Reddit user that first created deep fakes uploaded porn pornography in which people's faces were digitally replaced with those of celebrities. Scarlett Johansson was the first celebrity that they put in one of these videos. Other types of unethical deep fakes include smear campaigns, political videos, voice deep fakes, and synthetic resurrection which is a deep fake of a deceased person saying something that they may not have wanted to express if they were still alive. Next slide. Uh, notable examples of deep fakes include a deep fake of Nancy Pelosi acting drunk, which can be seen on the right. Uh, the left side of that image contains the original footage of Pelosi and the right side contains the deep fake, which you can see looks very real. Uh, Rudy Giuliani, previous mayor of New York, tweeted this video believing that it was real. Uh, that highlights the dangers of how deceptive these videos can be. There was another deep fake used to scam a CEO out of over $200,000. Someone did this with uh, deep fake algorithms to simulate the CEO's voice. They called their company using the fake voice and successfully had the company transfer $200,000 into an offshore account. Next slide. The choice to upload videos like Pelosi's publicly is unethical from rights ethics and virtue ethics standpoints. Um, it also violates IEEE and NSPE codes of ethics. These acts violate section I of IEEE's code of ethics, which emphasizes acting with integrity and responsible behavior in engineering. They also violate the fifth canon of the NSPE code of ethics, which states that deceptive acts should be avoided. Many deep fakes violate people's right not to be defamed. Just as slander defames people in an unconstitutional way, so can deepfakes. Engineers also have a responsibility to mitigate misuse when developing systems. This means that it's unethical for engineers to develop a technology that clearly has potential for misuse without taking measures to make that technology safer. Next slide. Events surrounding deepfakes have had a major impact on people's lives. 
Many celebrities like Scarlett Johansson have been shamed for deep fake pornographic videos that they didn't consent to. People have been scammed into giving up money and politicians have been defamed. After these events, social media platforms like YouTube and Reddit have stepped up to remove harmful deep fakes. Also organizations like DARPA, the defense agency, have stepped in to curb misuse of deep fake, deep fake tech with programs that detect altered videos. Next slide. Um, so there, there's not many great ways to prevent deep fakes since the technology is consistently growing and improving, but here are some possible solutions to help prevent deep fakes. So as stated earlier, uh, invest in deep fake detection and one of those main contributors is DARPA, which, uh, and not just DARPA, but there's many other research groups. Also, another possible way is to teach the public how to discern better from false information. And lastly, pass, pass legislation to, to regulate deep fakes better. And one act is the Deep Fake Accountability Act, which uh, is helps to keep people who make deep fakes accountable for the actions they do and put online. Up next. So for the outlook for future situations, as technology improves, deep fake technology will only improve, as I mentioned, that it gets better with open source coding. Pretty much what that means is people can take other people's code and find any mistakes and improve on it. Uh, as Kit and Aaron mentioned, the DARPA is the Defense and Advanced Research Project Agency, which is created by the United States, where they spent $68 million on technology to spot deep fakes. This accelerated the development of detecting fake digital visual media. Seen on the right is UC Berkeley's computer science department's algorithm to counter deep fakes and how they calculate or use this algorithm is to calculate the number of movements of head rotations, facial expressions, and their direction of eyes. If there's any uh, unusual or abnormal amount of movements that the deep fake video is occurring, there will be, it can be flagged right there. In conclusion, um, deepfake is a recent technology created through machine learning and AI algorithms that allow artists to manipulate people's face and photos and videos. When used incorrectly, deepfake violates both IEEE and NSPE codes of ethic, as well as other fundamental ethical theories. And we believe that with laws and regulation to keep deepfake within a proper ethical framework, um, this technology could be a useful tool in cinematography and many other applications. And, uh, Here's a great example of a deep fake uh, created by King. He shared this with us, a deep fake of a Shenyun on a monolith, which is pretty cool. And then here are our references. And thank you very much, Dr. Tran and everyone for listening. Thank you great. for staying behind for us. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great. great, thanks guys. Yeah, that was great. All right, so, that's, uh, so that concludes our first day presentation. So thank you everyone for, uh, uh, for staying and I'll see you guys on Thursday. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Have a good day. Thanks, guys. Quick, quick question, Professor. Sorry. Sure. What's up? Um, I was going to send this in the chat, but um, one of our group members, like, I don't know if you noticed, we were the second group to present today, and um, he, he hasn't responded to any of our messages or anything. He didn't, he wasn't in class today. He didn't, resp uh, he didn't present with us. So we took his name off the report. Like, I just didn't know if you knew he dropped the class or something. Yeah, let me, uh, let me stop the recording.